what I realized in my bio, it, it talks about my career at, NI, um, at the University of Florida before I joined the NIH last year. But since I'm in New York, I want to very proudly remind everyone that I am a native New Yorker. I was born here, and I did all my education here. My PhD is from Einstein, and I did my fellowship at Sloan Kettering. So it is great to be oh, back. Nice to uh, OK, so um, what I want to talk to you about today, and what I realize as being the end of the agenda, a lot of what I was planning on saying has already been said. But that being said, that will give us enough, I think, time to get back on track again. I want to focus the first part of my talk on the what the OAR does and how the NIH, fit, how the OAR fits into the NIH and what we do. Some of the middle part of the talk you've heard, and then I want to focus on um, some of the new um, initiatives and what's been going on in aging since um, the, particularly since the workshop that Jules mentioned that was held <coughs> held in uh, 2012, I believe. So the NIH was actually established a number of years ago, and the reason I'm showing you this slide is actually because of the insert which stands by the front door of what's called Building One, which is the original building on the campus. And it was the dedication that Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, made at the time of the dedication of the campus in Bethesda. And the insert talks about the NIH um, uh, developed to further the health of all, and it's dedicated to public health conservation of life, and the wise use of vital resources um, that are uh, from our nation. And I really think that that is, a, is an incredible foresight and statement, and it really sets the stage for the NIH even today. So the OAR's role is to coordinate the trans-NIH HIV AIDS research agenda. The Office of AIDS Research was authorized by Congress in 1985. And we're authorized to oversee, coordinate, and manage NIH HIV AIDS related research. We are authorized to establish scientific prop, uh, priorities for the research. We invest the research funds in line with the scientific priorities, and we report to Congress on how this money has been spent and what the outcomes are. So, this really, th our, what we do really falls into three main categories. We convene and Oops, not that far. Um, we convene, we, we can have workshops, we can uh, have advisory groups, task forces, uh, seminars, any kind of, of convening power, and we can do it at the NIH or we can do it offsite as well. And that allows us to bring together investigators and, and stakeholders from different fields, from different areas, from different interest groups, and to really start to catalyze the thinking about what the scientific agenda should be, where are the gaps, where are there hot new um, uh, findings that maybe we should be really focusing emergency funds on. Um, and then, of course, we coordinate these activities um, to make sure that they really are inclusive because when you see what our priorities are, you can see that it really falls into a way of looking at research from a transdisciplinary point of view. And at the NIH, there, um, the NIH is comprised of 27 institutes and centers and then a number of offices as well. And virtually all of these entities have an HIV agenda. Um, and while they develop their scientific agenda, OAR coordinates the trans aspects of this, so we can kind of keep a balance at a 30,000-foot level of what's going on in each of the institutes and centers, and working very closely with them. I meet with the directors frequently. And because of the work of the OAR and because of the way it was envisioned that this office would work, when you look at the organizational chart, which um, I realize probably is pretty boring, but at the top you have the Secretary of Health and Human Services, um, which is currently um, vacant. Um, <laughs> um, and under the um, Health and Human Service Secretary, one of the agencies that reports to that office is the NIH. And of course you know also FDA, CDC, HRSA, SAMHSA, all the other places are up there too. But within the NIH, the Office of the Director, the Office of Research is embedded in the Office of the Director. And in that way, it allows us to function in a trans-NIH way. So one thing I always tell people, and they have to be remember, the directors of the institutes and centers do not report to me, they report to Francis. 
Um, Tony Fauci does not report to me, even though people ask me that a lot. Um, so the OAR vision overall is really to advance research to end the HIV pandemic and to improve the health of people living with HIV. And in order to do that, we have a really robust research portfolio that not only deals with research, but also a lot of training. It transcends every area of clinical medicine and basic scientific investigation. As I've mentioned, it's trans-NIH, multidisciplinary, and global. And it represents the largest public investment in HIV AIDS research globally. It's a $3 billion investment by the American taxpayers in biomedical research That's in That's HIV AIDS. And that is the largest amount of money in the world that any entity puts into that area. So in order to focus and prioritize the distribution and the investment of these resources, in 2015, there was a re-articulation of the NIH HIV research priorities. And that includes reducing the incidence of HIV, developing next generation therapies, addressing the HIV associated comorbidities, co-infections and complications, and research towards a cure. And then overarching and over uh, cross-cutting across these are the cross-cutting priorities that include areas like basic research, like implementation science, information dissemination, um, uh, behavior and social science research, because many of those activities go across each of, you know, across all of the priorities. So as we know, aging with HIV, it, HIV is a chronic disease. Even with treatment, aging brings comorbidities, and there's a significant role of, for research in this area. You've already seen this, I'm sure, and that you know that within 2015, for example, in the United States, diagnoses of new HIV infection involved, included 25% of the diagnoses in people over the age of, of 45. People living with HIV, over um, almost 50% of the people who are infected in the United States are over the age of 55. And basically what's happened over the last 10 to 15 years of the HIV epidemic, if you think about it, is that it's really a condition that occurs and, and across the lifespan. It's no longer something that just occurs in pediatrics with mother to child transmission or in, in uh, youth, but it really occurs across the lifespan. Um, and this is an important consideration because when you think about the issues of prevention and treatment in the, at the different times of life, they're very, very different needs. What's going to work and resonate in youth in terms of prevention is not going to be the same type of approaches that are going to be needed to address the 25% of the new infections in people over the age of 50. And I think this, these are data I show because it really surprised me um, from part of these data really were surprising to me. In the first, looking at age disaggregated data in terms of the HIV care continuum across the lifespan, if you look in the first bar, uh, which is uh, knowing that you have an HIV diagnosis, not surprisingly, the youth know, fewer youth know that than the older people. But I think what's the real issue here is that when you look at the retention in care and viral suppression, it really doesn't matter what age group it is. The, the results are in, uh, uh, unsatisfactory and substandard across the age. But there again, if you think about it, what's needed to deal with the problem at each of the age groups is going to be very, very different. This phenomenon of aging with HIV is, I think Jewel mentioned it, it's not a transient effect or a transient occurrence. If you look at estimations for um, disaggregation of the epidemic, the age epidemic um, in 2025 and 2045, you can see an increase in the uh, proportion of people who are older. So this is the trend, and it's the trend not only in, in the United States, but in a lot of middle income countries as well. As you know, HIV increases risk for diseases associated with aging. Uh, most of these have already been mentioned. And again, inflammation plays a role in many aging and HIV-related uh, comorbidities, and I think this is an area 
of research that a lot has been um, focused in the National Institute of Mental Health, but I think there's definitely room for expansion of the research, the basic research in this area. Comorbidities increase with age. These are data from the Swiss HIV cohort study um, that show an increase in comorbidities uh, with age, as well as the co increasing in the number of co-medications with age, and that's already been discussed in um, the previous talks. So older people living with HIV have increased complications. There's subtle immune compromise that persists with treatment. Long-term um, HIV treatment leads to toxicity. HIV comorbidities affect many organs and systems. Inflammation may be at the root of many comorbidities. And the effects of aging and um, HIV are likely synergistic. But what I think when you look at a list of, of uh, bullet points like that, there's a rich opportunity to really increase our research um, efforts, not only on the clinical and the patient end of the continuum, if you will, but also at the beginning of the pipeline in the basic research area. And the other thing, too, is the increasing comorbidities that are occurring in people living with HIV globally. This is not just a U.S. phenomenon. It's, it's something, it's the trend in the middle-income countries uh, with HIV. It's a trend um, in some of the African countries, and it's definitely a trend in countries in the Asia-Pacific where the prevalence may not be as high as Africa, but there's um, significant increases in those epidemics as well. So as I mentioned, OAR coordinates the trans-NIH HIV research agenda. And so the way we've, this has been accomplished over the last five years or so is um, the HIV and aging working group that um, uh, Jules mentioned earlier that was held by Jack uh, Weitzgarver when he was the director. We had a listening day shortly after, about six months after I became the director so that I could meet a lot of the advocates and stakeholders from the community, and we had it at the um, uh, Fishers Lane in Rockville, where the OAR is located. Um, and there was a definite consistency, even five years later, that aging research um, was a significant uh, gap in the portfolio of, HIV, of NIH. Um, frailty, accelerated morbidity, morbidity and mortality, the polypharmacy issues, certainly ethnic sex and gender issues, and HIV and treatment um, impacts. Over the last um, five to eight years, the NIH has increased its investment in HIV aging research from about $50 million in 2011 to almost $100 million estimated for 2017. This, I want to remind you, this increase um, is in, at a time when the overall NIH budget and the HIV AIDS budget has remained absolutely flat. So this is an increase on a background of, a flat, of flat appropriations. You heard about the Max and Ys, so I'll skip that. I just want to cover in the last few slides um, some of the initiatives that are going on that um, may be on the street or have already gone through the concept phase, so they're, they're definitely in, in progress. And one of the ones that I'm really excited about is the collaboration between the Office of AIDS Research and the National Institute of Aging. And this emanated from a conversation, my first conversation with the director of um, National Institute of Aging, Richard Hodes, about um, the past, uh, before I started, there had been congressional hearings about the budget, and there had been some um, uh, tendency by some of the congressmen to try to pit the HIV people against the Alzheimer's people, like which was worse, and there's really more Alzheimer's. And so Richard and I talked about it and decided neither of us wanted to be engaging in that type of activity, and that really there was a lot of scientific justification um, to consider aspects of the mechanisms of Alzheimer's and the mechanisms of neurocognitive degeneration and disease in HIV, particularly in older people. And so we agreed to put together an initiative that should be coming out, um, I think the FOA will come out next year, early in 2018, and I'm really excited about that. There is actually, by the National Institute, Institute of Aging, at least another 14 HIV uh, um, related FOAs that either are on the street or will be um, announced shortly. So I think over the next five years, there'll be a huge increase in the activity um, and in the funding in this area. 
National Institute of Mental Health, you've, sort of, you've heard some of the uh, work that they've been doing. Um, they definitely um, are the leaders in the um, uh, latency area, looking at the interaction between viruses, HIV, and cells of the uh, central nervous system, interactions with cells of the innate system, micro, um, macrophages, monocytes, and um, cells in the innate system. And then there's a number of multidisciplinary studies of HIV and aging that really um, are encouraging applications and research at the intersection between HIV and aging to improve understanding of biological, clinical, and social behavior aspects, as well as patient-oriented uh, approaches for testing, prevention, and treatment of infection. So what the NIH does and the way um, the, I see the activities there is that the NIH is the leader for the research activities related to health of, of, um, of the world. Um, the research produces data, and the data leads us to informed policy decisions. At the NIH, the policies can be within and agency-specific, but also the data from the biomedical research outputs of, of the scientists who, who are being funded produce data that can also inform the other agencies, for example, in um, HHS. What HRSA does, what CDC does, what FDA does, in many of these cases is informed by the research output from the NIH portfolio. And so with that, I will um, thank you again for your attention and for a chance to be here and will, I guess, be part of the panel to answer questions. Thank you.